Okay. All right, I'm supposed to be on here. Can you guys hear me? Am I on? Hello, Ravi, sound people. Greetings, sound people. Look, here's the deal. Um, I'm going to be with you four times, and I'm excited about that. Every presentation will be a little different. And um, let me start by saying this. The world we live in is not as it seems. It really isn't. And most of us are so anchored down in just trying to survive and get the kids through college, pay the mortgage, do the whole the American dream. Other people in other continents, they don't even have that luxury. They're scrounging to get their next meal. And we see that, of course, in South America. And don't get me started on rabbit trails, we'll never get to this. The bottom line is, in my opinion, there is a secret, hidden, deliberately obfuscated history that's laying all around us. Cahokia is an hour and a half away from here. Cahokia is one of the most amazing places I've ever been. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I'll just throw this out anyway. That mound that supposedly the Native Americans built, there's a plaza in front of that. 45 acres, 45 acres. Visualize that in your head and ask yourself, how do they level that in the ancient world? Because it's within two inches of dead level. How do you level a 45 acre piece of property thousands of years ago. How do you do that in the ancient world? It's, it's screaming at us. It's right there. And archaeologists will insist that Native Americans, and you'll see this tonight when I get into this, the Mound Builders film, that they, they, they took these primitive hoes and they, you know, one basket full at a time. Are you aware that, that poverty or that, that Cahokia is the largest mound in North America, first of all? There's upwards of 450 to 500,000 tons of earth. 450 to 500,000 tons of earth. If you were to take dump trucks, okay, fill up the dump trucks with dirt, line them all up end to end, it's about 200 miles worth of dump trucks. And we're supposed to believe that Native Americans did this. You see, the thing is that the paradigm in which the scientific community operates and academia operates is Darwinism. And in Darwinism, and you're all taught this, you all know this, everybody who went through the school system, you're taught Darwinism, and you're taught it as absolute fact. But it's not fact, it's a bunch of hooey, it's the biggest bunch of nonsense that's ever been foisted on the entire planet. You go down to Peru, you go to Europe, you go anywhere, the whole planet runs not on Duncan, but on Darwin. Everything runs on Darwinism, and in Darwinism, there is no supernatural worldview. There is no God, there are no truths, there are no absolutes, there is no sin, there is no devil, there are no miracles, there's nothing. There's just random chance. And that's the Darwinian paradigm. I mean, that's about as hopeless as you can possibly get. But we look at ourselves and we know, we realize that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're, we're, we're incredible. I mean, look at the machines that we're all in. And then for the most part, they work pretty well, for the most part. Of course, when we get sick, not so, not so good. But for the most part, think about it. You're sitting here now, most of you have eaten lunch. Your stomach is digesting what you ate. If I had eaten lunch, I would have hoped for a meatball sandwich. Unfortunately, I didn't have any lunch. But that's good, because if I have lunch, it'll slow me down. The bottom line is, you're breathing right now. How does that work? Your body, you're not telling yourself, okay, take a next breath. It happens automatically. Your heart's moving like this. Your stomach is digesting all that. We're in these little biological body suits, which are fearfully and wonderfully made. And guess who made them? Guess who designed them? It wasn't just random chance over millions of years. If, if that's the case, then where's all the, you know, the, the things that didn't quite work? They're not there. We're, we're made in the image and likeness of God. There is a supernatural. I am a, I'm a firm supernaturalist. I think the supernatural is more real than the world around us. I think that we live in a holographic universe, which is why Father God rolls up everything like a scroll, like a scroll, and creates a new heavens and earth. Tell that to Messiah. That's impossible, though. It's absolutely physically impossible. Watch. Just watch what he's going to do. So there's a hidden history. Why? Because... When we start to drill into some of these sites, as you'll see, it points back to a supernatural worldview. When I'll show you the first slide uh, after the little introduction, which I skipped because I'm already doing it and I'm way ahead of myself, so what else is new? <laughs> but when, when, you look at, when you look at a place like Sak Sivaman and you stand there with the wind blowing in your face with huge megalithic stones, 
that some of these things weigh 80, 100, 120 tons. And all the Inca have is little copper chisels, ding, 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 ding. And the, and the tour guide insists that, oh, the Inca were master stone builders. But we know that the Inca didn't do that because we've got the historic records. When the conquistadors came in, they said, who built this? And the Inca said, we don't know. It was here when we got here. <laughs> but archaeologists and academics and the tour guides, oh, the Inca were great stone makers. No, they weren't. They had no idea how to do this. You can't duplicate it today. I've taken, I'll show you this. I've taken pictures of this to engineers, to stonemasons, and, they, and they, they react very nervously. Well, um, time and material. Hmm. <laughs> because that's about all you could do. That's where we're going. And I'm going to tip my hand here, and I probably shouldn't do it, but what the heck. <laughs> We've crossed a line, and the church has a morbid propensity towards ambivalence concerning the UFO phenomenon. That's tomorrow night. So I'm going to bring you up into what's happening now. Tucker Carlson. How many people watch Tucker? Okay. Tucker Carlson. How many people watch CNN? <laughs> okay. What you've got to learn to do is, is flip it to both channels so you can see the disparity. You've got to do that. You've got, you got to get, oh, I hate seeing that. Good. Hate it all you want, but watch it so you can see what these rabid <clears throat> are saying. Thank you. But you've got, you got to flip back and forth. So where was I? Tucker Carlson, 2017, December, and I'll show you the clip tomorrow night, and I'll show you the recent one tomorrow night. Tucker Carlson has this guy. Commander David Fravor. So I'm already on the presentation tomorrow night. Am I in a time warp or something? What's going on here? Come back, LA, come back. So Tucker Carlson has David Fravor, Commander David Fravor, an F-18 pilot. And Fravor, and they show, this is what they, Tucker Carlson's here, David Fravor's in the middle of the triptych. And then they show classified footage of the UFO on Fox News primetime. And Tucker Carlson asked David Fravor, what was this in your opinion? And Favor says, whatever it was, it was not of this world. That's the line. We just crossed it. I figured, I looked at my wife and I said, this is my wife, by the way, Peggy Marzulli. Give her a hand, folks. Let's embarrass the heck out of her. Go, Miss Peggy, go. So, <laughs> so, I figured my phone's going to be ringing off the hook. Pastors will be calling me. We've, we've crossed that line. Disclosure just happened. The next day, I, I braced myself for the onslaught of emails. My phone ringing off the hook. Oh, my gosh. Quick, get the batteries out. E Flatline. One email. Oh, wait, did you see Tucker Carlson? Oh, my gosh. One guy got it. One guy got it. Fast forward three weeks ago. It's another rung up the ladder. And this one should put, raise the hair in the back of your neck. Tucker Carlson has this guy, Luis Elizondo, on. He worked for the government for a period of time, the whole UFO thing. Tucker Carlson asked him twice. I'll show you the clip tomorrow night. You'll have to wait. Twice. He goes, has the U.S. government, do the U.S. government have in their possession debris, wreckage from a down UFO. Tucker Carlson asked the question, does the American government, the United States government, have debris from a crashed UFO? Elizondo looks right at the camera and says, and he pretends he's nervous. I think the whole thing is staged, but I got my tinfoil hat on and I'm wearing it proudly. <laughs> I've got to switch to invisible. So he asked Elizondo this, and Elizondo replies, well, Tucker, I can't violate my NDA non-disclosure agreement. But the simple answer is yes. Guess what? He just violated his NDA because he was told to violate his NDA. He was given permission, in my opinion, to violate it. What did he just say? Yes. The United States government has in their possession wreckage, debris from a UFO. And I said, surely my phone will be ringing off the hook. People will be going, oh my gosh, LA, everything you've been saying for 20 years is coming true right under our noses. E Flatline. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? And I predicted this six months ago. I said, you watch. They're going to trot somebody on who will start pointing back to 
wreckage or the, the Roswell crash. The next thing is photographs, real photographs, perhaps of Gray's, perhaps of Gray's meeting. It's going to happen. And what's amazing is this is the coming great deception. This is it. And I'll get into all this tomorrow night. So I've just given you a primer. Anyway, my name is L.A. Marzulli. <laughs> I've written a bunch of books, a bunch of, made, made a bunch of films, and I yak pretty much everywhere. And when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. If they married any of them, they chose. The Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. He is mortal as days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. This is a very extremely charged verse. And people look at this and they tap dance around it. And many seminaries will teach that the sons of God were actually the godly line of Seth. But that's not what the text says. And the daughters of men were somehow the hoochie mamas of Cain. But I don't see hoochie mama in the text either there. So something is going on. And the key is Genesis 3.15. If we don't understand what's happening in Genesis 3.15, when we arrive at Genesis 6, we're clueless. Genesis 3.15. Okay, Adam and Eve has just done the unthinkable. So Jesus, I believe, was the pre-incarnate Christ, is in the garden with them. So Adam and Eve over here, the serpent's over here. Ever wonder why Eve talks to the serpent? She's not alarmed by the serpent. This is natural. Oh, the serpent's talking to me. Anybody else would go, oh my gosh, Adam, come here, the serpent's talking to me. No, she just converses with it. There's familiarity there. So there's something hidden in the whole Genesis text that we don't get. Did the animals talk? I don't know. Possibly. If the serpent's talking, and she's not alarmed by it, but the text is silent and we have no idea. The bottom line is, the mandate comes down. The seed of the, the, seed of the serpent, the offspring of the serpent, will be at enmity at war with the offspring of the woman. If we don't understand what that means, then we're clueless in the rest of the Bible. Because it says, he, the coming Messiah, will crush the serpent's head, the serpent will bruise his heel. That's it. That's the whole Bible. Understand that, and you understand exactly what's going on. Don't understand that, and you're clueless, in my opinion. We are clueless if we don't get that. Because it sets it up, because three chapters later, guess what? It's the offspring of a serpent that manifests, the sons of God. And by the way, I'll, and I'll give you this. This is a new book we're working on. It's never been, it's never, I've never heard anybody talk about it. So you have to raise your right hand. Raise your right hand, please. I solemnly swear not to tell anybody this information. Or I will have to come to L.A. Marzulli's house and cook him dinner. Everybody wonders why the angels would do this. The book of Enoch, which is not part of our canon, I get that. The book of Enoch states, and Semyazov is the ringleader of the fallen angels, 200 watcher angels descend on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. And Semyazi, the leader, goes, I fear ye will not agree to do this thing, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. What the heck is he talking about? He knows exactly what he's going to do. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He's going to... Um, take the women, he's going to create a hybrid, I believe in Nephilim, but at some point the judgment's going to come down. The penalty of a great sin, it's a suicide mission. And he knows it and he does it anyway. Why? They have nothing else to lose. The fallen ones are already banished. They're already outside of heaven. The, the rebellion has already happened. And we don't know that number. So 200 watcher angels, I get all that. But we have no idea what the number is. Is it millions? We don't know. And we know in Revelation, Michael fights with Satan and, and the whole thing and they're cast down. Woe to the inhabitants on earth. Wait till that happens. And of course, I think the church is long gone by then. But it's going to happen and we're pushing towards that period of time. So it's a suicide mission. This is why people have so much trouble with that text right there. There, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Ooh, I get to use a pointer. Isn't that good? Right there. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. What does also afterward mean? It means a little later on. And people tap dance around this, this text and torture it and they tell you that somehow Ham's wife had the, had the Nephilim gene and she carried it on the ark, which makes God you know, why would God destroy the earth? Well, oh, I guess I'll give Ham wives a pass. I'll just, I'll just pretend I don't see that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. No, not buying that for a second. Never had. And the Lord gave me this about eight months ago, and, and I'm writing a book, and it will be out in the fall, basically on the second incursion. And what it, it's a suicide mission. They do it over and over and over again. 
They are trying to pollute and contaminate the genome because if they can corrupt the seed, Messiah will never come. The one who will crush the serpent's head will never be born because it won't be human. That's the end game here. They are obsessed with creating a hybrid being. Once the Messiah comes and he dies on the cross for your sin and my sin and the sin of all mankind, they change their tactics. It's over. But the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God saw the daughters of men and had children by them, great men of renown, fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture. If the Nephilim were here, and if the Bible is true, can we find the remnants of it? Can we find evidence that points back to their being on the planet? And I'm on the trail, folks. This is what I do. I am so on fire with it, can't you tell, that I, you know, I just, I wake up, ask her. I mean, I wake up, I'm all excited because we are uncovering the secrets. And our, and our mission statement is to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air. To expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and to herald to proclaim, to herald the return of the King Jesus. That is our mission statement. That's what we do. That's what we live by. All of our films, all of our books, everything points to that. And guess what? The attacks sometimes are through the roof because the enemy doesn't want this out. I guarantee you the enemy doesn't want this information in your head because once you see it and once you un we uncover it together, it changes your whole paradigm. It changes the way you look. we look at Scripture. Because everything is move, counter move, move, counter move. We are at war. The church is at war. How many people put on their armor of God this morning? Well, uh, some. Every hand here should be up because we're at war. And when, when we start to wake up, the enemy hates that. Boom, go back to sleep. It's just like the Matrix in some ways. It really is. It's just like the Matrix. So look at this. Look at this right here. This is Sacsayhuaman in Peru. It's about 13,000 feet above sea level. Look at the stones. Look how carefully they're placed. Sacsayhuaman. Look at the little people below. This is pre-flood architecture in my opinion. It is Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. It is a remnant of something and we don't know what it is. We don't really understand what it was used for. But what we do see is this. A pointer. How does this work? Hmm. So we have walls, and they zigzag, and we're not sure why they zigzag. Look at the joints here. This is andesite stone. It is andesite stone. And as you can see here, it is extremely... Why didn't it change? Oh, she's going to change it. She's behind. Quick, change the slide. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, change the slide. <laughs> it works. What can I tell you? I got the power. Ha! Okay, sorry. Look, you got to have some humor with this stuff. At least you're laughing. Some, sometimes the audience is like, oh, no laughing in church already. So look, look, look at the joints here. This is andesite stone. Andesite is seven on a Mohs hardness scale. The hardest being number 10. This is seven. So guess what? Copper chisels can't cut andesite. It doesn't work. We've got a guy... I've got a copper chisel, a replica of what the Incas would have used, a little block of anesthetic stone. He goes, tink, tink. He turns it over and shows, dull. So if you can't cut the stone, if you can't move the stone, because there's no beast of burden, look at this little guy here, look at this big guy right here. How was this move 45 miles from where the quarry was to this? And, and moreover, how does this happen? Look at the joints. Look at the joints. Do you see, now, we, when we build today, we build this, you know, blocks. Everything's nice and square. You set a little cinder block on there, put a little mud on, tink, 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 put another one next to it. Everything's very uniform. Look at, look at the stonework. Why are we getting feedback? I know we're getting feedback. Thank you. Still getting feedback. Mr. Salman, we're getting feedback. Okay, cool, thank you. So look at this. Look at this. Look at the joinery here. Look at the size of the rocks. Realize that not one stone is exactly like another. Look at this guy here. Why do, you, why do this? Why go out of your way to make something absolutely impossible? How many people here work with wood? Anybody? If you work with wood and I say, hey, I want you to make a wall out of this with uh, pine, 
uh, can you guys do it? We'll, we'll give you the blocks and you guys just get, you know, big jigsaws and bandsaws and have at it. You know, make a small replica, okay? Just make a small replica. You know and I know that even in pine, with jigsaws and stuff, it would be hard. And the slight stone. The stones weigh 30, 40, 60, 100 tons. How the heck was that done? How is it done? This is what I mean. It's staring at us. It's right there in front of us. And, and, our, and it's like there's a term. It's called cognitive dissonance. You know what that is? Cognitive dissonance is when we look at something and there's nothing in our grid system to process it. And we kind of go, twing. And we just kind of back up. I don't want to deal with that right now. Uh, I know what I'm looking at, but I really don't want to. I just want to go back to sleep. Can I have a chocolate milkshake? <laughs> Maybe a big gulp. Anybody got any raisinets? And we just kind of, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get near that right now. This is just too weird. You tell me how this was done in the Neolithic 3,000 years ago. You show me. Look at this. It's just stupid. Look at this. Look at the curve. Look at this. Why well, just make a little thing right here because I got nothing else better to do. I mean, look at this. Look at the stonework. It is some of the most pristine stonework on the planet. I've taken it to architects. I've shown the pictures to engineers. And they, like I said, they look at me nervously. Why? Because they know that even in modernity, with cranes and lasers and diamond saws, this is really, really difficult. Extremely difficult. And guess what? The one thing if the cuts were just on the surface, they're not. They go all the way through the stone. So if the stone is, let's say, six feet, that cut goes all the way, and it's polished, goes all the way. The next stone comes up to it, no gap. Fallen Angel technology, Nephilim architecture, Sacsayhuaman. And I tell you, when you go there, when I lead a tour there a couple of years ago, I, 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 had the, I had everyone in the tour group, I said, touch the stones, touch them. You are touching the fingerprints of the supernatural, in my opinion. The Inca didn't do it. How do, how do you move stones that weigh 80 tons when there's no beast of burden? And all they've got is llamas. So they're going to take 2,000 llamas together? That's not going to work. And the whole log rolling thing, it's just nonsense. 45 miles away, we're going to roll these things on logs? Are you out of your mind? Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. There was a civilization here, and what many of us don't get is that when the fallen angels came in the days of Noah, it's about 450 to 500 earth years before the flood. Plenty of time to build this stuff. Plenty of time to create all the mischief that they wanted to create. Plenty of time to do it. The fingerprints of the supernatural are literally all over the planet. All over the planet. Heck, Tohokie is like an hour and a half from here. <laughs> the largest mound in America. Well, Native Americans built that LA. We, we know. We, we found the tools. These little, little hoe handles. and we, we found these hoe handles, and that's how they did it. One basket full at a time. Poverty Point is 28 million single buckets of earth. 28 million single buckets of earth to create Poverty Point, which is the second largest mound um, in America. 10,000 mounds in Ohio alone. And I'll talk all about tonight and show you what is just all around us. So it's Nephilim architecture. It's fallen angel technology. Whoever built this took the tools with them. And this is what we're up against, and this is what drives me nuts. Every Friday on Ancient Aliens, and by the way, your kids and your grandkids, for the most part, for the most part, are already thinking the whole ancient alien paradigm. They've already bought it and they're already online. Yeah, ancient astronauts, they, that's where all this stuff came from. The aliens built it. Yeah, that's good. They came from some other planet and they came here and colonized the Earth and, you know, we were their slaves for a while and then we broke off, yada, yada, yada. They, uh, trust me, talk to your kids. If they watch ancient aliens, they've already drunk the Kool-Aid. And the grandkids especially. So, once again, the Christian worldview is cut off. Eponese. We have an explanation for all this, and it's a biblical one. It's rooted and grounded in the Bible, and it shows us that these cities were here. 
and that these, these places were all over the earth. And they were here, the fallen angels were here, and they cohabited. They had, they had offspring, the Nephilim, which was fallen angel DNA, DNA from a woman creating this hybrid being, which was never supposed to be here at all. The giants, the Nephilim, were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. This is what we're looking at. And, and we don't understand this. And unless we come to grips with it, when we get into other things, which I'll talk about later, like the abduction scenario, where people are seeing hybrid entities, which appear human, but they're not human. What about the X-Men? How many people go see the X-Men movies? They're hybrid beings. That's what they are. They're hybrid beings. They have superpowers. We are being conditioned, trust me. We are being conditioned for all this. It is a managed agenda as my, the late, my mentor, one of my mentors, Dr. Chuck Messer, used to say. It's a managed agenda, and we are sitting under it. We are living in this thing. Do you think Luis Elizondo just suddenly appears on Tucker Carlson's show? Mm -mm. It's a managed agenda. Do you think Tucker Carlson asked him that question? And, and, and Elizondo feigns like, oh, I better not answer that question. I'll break my NDA. Yes, you just broke your NDA. Just by saying yes, you broke your NDA. You broke your non-disclosure agreement. You can't say anything. All you can say is, I cannot confirm or deny that question, Mr. Carlson. That's what you would say. Or I, I refuse to answer that question. He says yes. He spills the beans on national TV. It's unbelievable. And the American people, and the church in particular, don't do anything. This woman is about five foot five. Look at the size of the stones. The quarry is 45 miles away. Look at the precision. And no one knows how it was done. Nobody, including myself. There are theories. Did they melt the stone? Did they levitate the stone? We don't know. Nobody knows. Well, hey, levitation. That, that sounds kind of sci-fi, eh? That's why we have floating accents in the Bible? Hmm? Philip is transported from one area to the other? Virgin birth. Do we really believe in the supernatural? Or do we just pretend it's there? Why? Right? Well, well, you know, that was 2,000 years ago. Well, I asked all over. Blah, blah, blah. Virgin birth, floating accents, talking donkeys. It's Mr. Ed, right? Sure. <laughs> Virgin birth, floating accents, talking donkeys. Men that walk on water. What if that's changed to wine? It was probably really good wine, too, according to what the steward said. Hmm. Glass of Cabernet, Lord. <clears throat> but I digress. Water stands up as a heap, Moses. Staffs that turn into serpents. Do you realize what we believe? It's crazy. The rapture of the church, we're all just going to suddenly disappear, rise in the air and meet the Lord. Hallelujah. Bring it on yesterday at 10, please. <clears throat> we all grow weary of the nonsense. Oh, I could go down this rabbit hole. I really could. The whole crazy political nonsense in this country. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, yeah, I'm going to do it. I don't even go ahead and do it it's okay it's a captive audience they'll never be able to get out <laughs> so <clears throat> what was that okay? maybe we need an exorcism <clears throat> pastor so <clears throat> the Syrian war allowed over one million Muslims to storm into Europe and no one did anything now Charles Martel turned back the Muslim hordes the battle of Tours and then the gates of Vienna, they turned back the Muslim hordes. But in 2015, or whenever it was, come right in. Meanwhile, hundreds of churches have been torched all throughout Europe. Well, that's over there, right? Surely the same thing isn't happening over here. Millions of illegal aliens, hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens are streaming across the border. It is orchestrated, and it is deliberate. It is to break the back of the country, and take, and you stand up and, if you're a nationalist, you're an evil person. If you believe in your country, you're an evil person. Oh my gosh. And these idiots on CNN will tell you such. And all these people, oh, they're right-wing nationalists. Blah, 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 blah. Well, let me see. I believe, in, I believe in my country. I believe in the Constitution. Well, the Constitution is a living document. We're just going to change it now. No. We're not going to do that. Well, we don't like the Electoral College because we lost the election, last election because of that. See, what, see where it's going? It's, it's a managed agenda. And you know who's behind it? The fallen cherub. It's to, it's to move this whole world into a one world government. 
and that's and by the way, the whole transgender thing, right, right out of right out of Hell's Kitchen, right. blur the sexes. There really is no male or female anymore. You know, just blur it all. It's it's all okay. You know, I thought the church. I just got to get get this off my chest because I mean, I have other presentations where I, I get into all this stuff, but I'm not. I don't have time. I only I only have four things, so I'm going to try to weave things in and out. So. Just think about this, that when Obama with the Supreme Court and they voted gay marriage the law of the land, once again I thought, this is it, the church is going to rise up, it's over, we'll be taking to the streets, this is it, finally pastors will start talking about it, hallelujah, we'll push back. One clerk in North Carolina stands up and goes, I'm not doing this. Now it's the law of the land. And if you say something against it, you're a bigot. I don't believe in gay marriage. Good, I'm a bigot. How does that sound? Yay! Yay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But that, that's what we're up against, folks. Now let's get back to the, our usual programming. Thank you. Now, what's interesting is, is there's places all around Sox <laughs> That's the little delayed thing. This is original. The bottom rung. And this here is what I affectionately call Inca slop. This is stone that's indigenous, found on the ground, and this is Inca work right here. I wouldn't mind to have that wall in my backyard. Not, not the bottom wall, that would be really cool. But you know, this is, this is some pretty nice stone work there. I get it. You'll notice the stones are about head size. There's, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing even remotely this size in this wall that the Inca has made. It's a disparity between one builder, the, the original builders, and those who came later. And yet, archaeologists will look at this and tell you it's all Inca. Well, how can you guys, you know, how can you guys possibly say that when all they have is copper chisels, show me. And this is why, this is why in our film, this is what we do, we push back and go, show me. You know, we'll pay for it, let's get some, let's get some chisels. Just show me, just put two rocks together with these copper chisels, okay? Just make two little angles and put them together. Can you do it? Of course they can, because copper dulls the moment you hit it against andesite stone. <clears throat> but they repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, and it's hysterical to watch the tour guides and the tourists that come down. They're, oh, okay, Inca built it. But where are we going next? Meanwhile, we're staring at something which is so enigmatic, <clears throat> so incredible, and points back directly to the supernatural, points back directly to the presence of fallen angels on the planet and the Nephilim. Why are they here? To corrupt the genome. Why would God allow that? We don't understand the protocols of the heavenly war. Let me get a slurp. <clears throat> this is great because I'm giving you like, like four or five presentations in one. <laughs> For my next trick, I will make, no, just joking. I'm going to make myself disappear, poof. <laughs> um, where was I going? Inca what was that? Inca slop. No, Inca slop was before. I was going to go someplace with this. <laughs> Hold on. Well, if, if I don't get it in the next three seconds, I'll just pass on it. <laughs> there it is. No, it's... Um, why is this important? Because we are at war, like I said earlier, and the protocols, that was the, the protocols of the heavenly war were not, thank you, Father. It's always good to give credit when he kicks the memory back in, right? <clears throat> the protocols of this war were not given. I'll tell you an example. Most of us have read Daniel, okay? So Daniel's, the whole backstory is in Babylon, you know, the temple's all messed up, ba beep, ba bop, ba beep. He's in, he's in captivity, 70 years, we all know that. One of the most disturbing passages in, in Scripture is Daniel prays, and 21 days later, the angel shows up. And he says, hey, Dan, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Dan, I, I was dispatched immediately from the throne room. That's comforting, isn't it? Immediately he's dispatched. How does that work? Daniel prays. I mean, how does the prayer, I mean, have you ever thought about that? You know, well, I'm praying now, Lord. I'm sure, surely you're listening to me. Mm. Not necessarily. 
But he does. How does that work? We don't know. But the prayer goes out, the angels dispatch, and then we get to the troubling part. 21 days goes by, and he shows up. Ta-da! I'm sorry I'm a little late, 21 days. <laughs> what can I tell you? Now, when we're driving the car and a, and a tractor trailer goes, starts to swerve into us, and we go, Jesus, help, and all of a sudden we find ourselves on the other side of the accident, how does that work? And I have people that have had that happen to, and there's maybe some of you in this room that have had miracles like that, where things have just like, boom, and it's like, how did that happen? Because space and time just got transversed. Here's the deal. The angel tells Daniel and gives us a glimpse into the heavenly war, the protocols of this heavenly war, which we're not privy to. We're not privy to. Job is another one. Job should be read in the churches every single year because Job is, our, is, is, the, is like the, the model of what the enemy wants to do to everybody in this room. It's an advanced course in spiritual warfare 101. That's why it's there. And what happened to Job will never happen to any one individual again. And, it, and it's deliberate. You can do anything, but don't kill him. You can't kill him. Protocols. Why does God allow it? Why does God allow Job to be tempted? We can all read Job, and then we can understand exactly what the enemy can do. He can put thoughts into people's heads and have them go attack. He can create storms. He can create tempests. He can do all sorts of crazy things. He can make sickness happen in your body. All that's scriptural. So getting back to Daniel, what happens is the angel says, I was dispatched, but the prince of Persia restrained me. Whoa, wait a minute. What is that? What are you talking about? What do you mean? Who is this prince of Persia? How did he restrain him? Why can't Daniel just do an end run? Okay, prince of Persia's there. Fine, you got your territory. I'm coming in the back way. He can't do it. He's got to go get reinforcements. And then they fight. Michael and his angels fight. How do they fight? Aren't you curious? Doesn't that keep you up at night? My gosh, it keeps me up at night. I want to know. They don't fun wrestle. It's not laser swords. So what the heck are they doing? But they're doing something. Can angels be wounded? They must. They're eternal beings, but maybe they can be wounded. See where it's going? The Bible is the most craziest book on the planet. And I love it. Because when you read that, you go, oh my gosh, what does that mean? And he gets through. But he's got to go get Michael because it's too strong. He can't get through on his own. Doesn't that freak you out? Man, it should freak the heck out of everybody in this room because there's a principality there, and that principality's never been deposed. Never been deposed. The Prince of Persia has never been deposed. He's still there. He's still in power right over Persia. Gee, where's all the fighting going on? <laughs> Who is ISIS, and why do they do the things that they do? We get a glimpse in the protocols of the heavenly war. We are at war. God could turn all this stuff over if he wanted to, blink his eye, and it's done. He doesn't do it. He allows it to play out. And we know from the prophecies, specifically the book of Revelation, where all this is headed to. All the prophecies concerning the Messiah. No one saw the Messiah coming. No, and Mary didn't get it. I'm sure Mary's sitting there at the cross going, he's going to come down, just wait a couple of minutes. Trust me, he's going to come down. It's, it's going to end well. It's going to be really cool. Watch what he does. And they're all sitting there going like, he's not coming down. Looks like he's dying. And when he dies, sword pierces her heart. She doesn't understand. Nobody gets to cross. Nobody. But here's the deal. He's got the keys. He just won. It's game over. Yes. And after that, after it's game over, Nephilim are off the earth. The whole thing changes. And then we get into the book of Daniel. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to them. Their seed, who's the they? Whose seed is mingling with the seed of men? It can't be men's seed mingling with the seed of men. That makes no sense. The word cleave is the word for marriage, which goes back to Genesis. So it's not something else is going on here. And it's in the latter days. It's in the latter days. It's in the window of time that we find ourselves living in right now. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men. What the heck are we talking about? Come tomorrow night, the abduction phenomenon, the hybrids which are being, which are being created. They're Nephilim. What does Jesus say like, be like the days of Noah? Out of all the scripture, and all he's got is the Old Testament, remember, the Tanakh, he does nothing, New Testament ain't written yet, so all he's got is the Tanakh. Out of all the books in the Bible, he points back to, it'll be like the days of Noah when I return. Why does he say that? Why does he say that? And then you read the book of Daniel, and there's like, oh my gosh, something's going to happen. Their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not, there will be no marriage, which is exactly what's happening with the abduction phenomenon. But let's go on. Look at this. This is a gateway, a gateway down into the sacred valley in Peru. Look at the stonework here. 
the pristine stonework, and then the Inca, which is pretty good. That's a nice wall, but this is totally different than this. Do you guys agree? Yes. I'm not smoking something, right? I mean, you, you can see that. You can see that the stonework on the left is completely different than this. There are two different builders, and that stonework is so pristine that you cannot slip a piece of paper between it. This is from Oye Tintambo. Oye Tintambo is another site in Peru. I think and believe it's pre-flood also. This is also andesite. Why is this made? Why are these stones like this? What are these for? Why go through this kind of trouble? Because first of all, they can. They're not sweating. Second of all, I believe that these are remnants of some sort of a machine. I have no idea what that machine was used for. I can, you know, I have, I can, I have conjecture there. I have ideas, some theories, but no one knows. Look at this. What the heck is that? You tell me. You tell me what that is. No one knows. What is this little niche here for? Look at this. Look at this. And whoever does it, look, look at the corners. Look, look how absolutely perfect it is. No one's doing this with a chisel, guys. Nobody's doing that with a chisel. End of story. Something else is going on here. Fingerprints of the supernatural. Nephilim architecture. Nephilim architecture. Fallen angel technology. And look where it comes from. There are holes. You can actually see, if you look really carefully, it's actually better on this monitor, because you'll see it on the monitor. You can actually see the turns of the drill as it goes in. And, and it's, it's taking out about an eighth of an inch of material as it goes down. It's like, it's almost like it's butter. How the heck is that possible? We don't have drills that'll do that today. Not, not at that speed. Why this shape? Look at the stonework. Look at the absolute perfection of the stonework. Look at this. Again, this is Oye Tintambo. Next slide, please. Thank you. Right here is the original, and, it, and it's put into the mountain, which is why it remains. Look at, look at the side here. Look, look at the, the way the stones line up. This is the foundation for whatever this was. People call it the temple of the sun. It's always the temple of the sun. You guys are just making this stuff up. No one has any idea, myself included, what, who, what the builders called this or what it was used for. But it's always, oh, it's the temple of the sun wherever you go. A temple of the moon over there, a temple of the sun over here. They all say the same thing. They just make stuff up. They just make it up. It's like the Hopewell Indians. Well, we have no idea what they call themselves, though, eh? but we're going to call them the Hopewell. Because Hopo was a farmer, and we like that name. It sounds pretty good. They have no idea. I'll get into that tonight. They have no idea who the people that created the mounds that are all around this, what they called themselves. They have no idea. And uh, let me spill the beans here real quick. What they will tell us, so you'll come back tonight, they, they will tell us, this is what they say, and I'm not making this up, that Native Americans built the mounds, Native Americans built the mounds, but then over a few hundred years, they just forgot that they had done so. <laughs> Scout's honor. So that's the Kool-Aid, right? You just start drinking the Kool-Aid. So this is Oye Tintambo. Why do that? Why do that? Why do that? You see, when you look at that, some people go, well, golly, let's just, just show us a bunch of rocks with some weird angles. I mean, I don't get it. <clears throat> How many people are woodworkers? I'll give you three pine blocks, have fun. And you know as I, and I know, if the blocks were like this, could you do it with pine and sandpaper? Yeah, but that's pine. And you've got modern equipment. This is andesite, and you don't have modern equipment. And you'd be hard pressed to do it with lasers. So how was it done? And they don't really don't know, but because it's a managed agenda, the Inca did it. It's nonsense, it's total, absolute nonsense. Just show me. We'll just get three pieces of andesite. Just, just, just give me three rocks. Just, we'll give a, a master stone carver some copper chisels and let him go at it. So look at this. What's that used for? Look at this. This is the, the wall, the only part of it that still exists. And look at, look at the stonework and how absolutely pristine it is. And there's some little clues. See this? They look like stairs. Now, again, I'm taking my cultural 
what's in my, my grid and putting it on that. And I don't know whether they are stairs or not. They could be symbols for something else. But when I look at, at this, I think of Jacob's ladder as above, so below type of a thing. Look at these little splines that are here. So the builders knew about the earthquakes because modern day masons look at this, not Masonic Lodge, modern day stone masons look at this and they go, these more than likely are used so when earthquakes happen, things will, will shift a little instead of falling apart. Look at the size of the stones. A six foot person comes up to about there. And these stones are quarried over on the other side of the valley. I think it's pre-flood. I think the flood wiped the temple out or whatever it was. That's an earlier shot of it from like over 100 years ago. That's cool. Not much has changed. There's a shot. Look at this right here. I think I have a close-up of this. No, I don't. Let me go back. Right here. Look at this right there. Look at that. I mean, look at look at the irregular lines. Look at the way. I mean, it's in some ways it's playful, but they're not sweating it. They can they do it because they can do it. And and no one's going, ah, oh, I just blow another piece of stone. I hate when that happens. It almost fit. No, it's just they're just building this stuff. And it's global. It's everywhere. And it seems like it goes in phases. We've got this is the pristine stuff, and then after the flood, it changes slightly, and we get the whole megalithic, which I'll get into a little bit later. This is standing here, looking out at the sacred valley there. That's what you see. So if I put my back against the squall where those people were sitting, and I looked out, I would see this. That is the sacred valley. They call, it, they call this the sacred valley. Look at the stonework. Something cataclysmic happened here and it threw the stonework down. Remember the stones that I showed you just before this, that the big one with all the different angles? That was found at the bottom of that valley and then just stood upright. Something cataclysmic happened which blew this thing completely away. Noah's flood? Yeah, that's what I think. That's conjecture on my part. But it's not a bunch of people breaking the stones and throwing them down. The ink that came into this and found it this way. Chichen Itza. And what's crazy about this, this is in Mexico. We were actually slated in 2012. I was invited by a bunch of New Age people to go down to Chichen Itza, the Mayan calendar, and speak there. And um, I had some battle buddies that were going to go with me, Russ Dizdar for one. And we raised the money to go down. Um, they were paying my way, but I, didn't, I wasn't going to go alone. And everybody had a really bad feeling about it, including myself. Um, Chichen Itza is a ritualistic site. This site is highly charged. Over 50,000 people were ritualistically sacrificed at Chichen Itza. They're laid on a, on a table with the flint, the hearts cut out. 50,000 people ritualistically slaughtered. Why wake up on a Monday morning and go, well, we need to sacrifice some people that God's demanded? Where's that coming from? Who, the, who demands this kind of sacrifice? When we look in the biblical prophetic narrative, we see that the Israelis were doing exactly the same thing. Sacrifices to Moloch, the same, the same exact type thing. It all springs from the pit of hell. Why? The life is in the blood. Why they sacrifice human beings? Because when you sacrifice it, the blood is spilled. It creates a, a power base for the fallen ones to come and land. This is after the flood. This is post-flood. So it's a whole different deal than what it was pre-flood. And we don't understand the complete dynamics, but I'll, I'll give you something. This is really troubling. Really troubling. And I, I in some ways, I, I, I hate to say it, but I have to say it, and I'll say it in great detail tomorrow night that I believe that we are under a brass heaven. We are under a brass heaven because of the blood that's been spilled on this planet. If you think for one second, and I'll, I'll hammer this home tomorrow night, if, you, if we think for one second that 1.5 billion aborted babies, 1.5 billion, billion, billion aborted babies since Roe v. Wade on the planet, if you don't think 
that that's a Luciferian blood ritualistic sacrifice which has completely covered this planet and this is why we pray and nothing happens for the most part. Yeah, you can break through it. Yes, the church can break through it. If we come together and fast and pray and seek the Lord, yeah, we can break through it. I'm not a defeatist. We have victory. I get that. But you know what? We are under a brass heaven. Look at what's happening in the world. 1.5 billion. Bully for Alabama. Bully for Alabama. Hallelujah. They push back. We're not going to do this anymore. More states need to do it. And you know what? It may do this. It may totally divide the country. Because you get these crazy people on the left. Oh, I'm proud of my abortion. This is great. It's my body. I can kill all the babies I want to. It's insanity. It's absolute insane absolutely crazy. And this is the culture we're living in. We are under a brass heaven. 50,000 people ritualistically slaughtered at Chichen Itza, the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl. Oh, the enemy's present. Thank you. <laughs> oh. During the fall and the spring equinoxes, look at this. Right? You need to change it one more time. No! See the serpent head? See the undulating serpent as it comes down the pyramid? So who gets up on a Monday morning and figures that out? Who goes, well, we're going to make a pyramid and it's going to look like only on the equinoxes on a certain day, so we've got to position the pyramid. It's going to be all the stone, yada, 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 and the angles of the pyramid have to be such so when the sun hits it right, it'll look like a great serpent slithering down the sides of the pyramid. How the heck is that done? Fallen angel technology? Yep, Nephilim architecture all day long. They were completely and utterly immersed in it. It was totally Luciferic, in my opinion. And the results are there. 50,000 people ritualistically slaughtered at Chichen Itza. By the way, if you ever go to a place like that, you'd never go up on the top. Never go up on the top. And you pray like crazy beforehand, and you pray like crazy when you leave the site. I've never visited the site, and because Mexico is now run completely by the drug cartels, I'm not going down there anytime soon. End of story. So let's continue. That's the top. No, <clears throat> anyway, that's, that's in Mexico. We, did, we didn't have human sacrifice in, in our country, right? Hmm. <laughs> So, this is, I guess some of you, and I don't know why I came here. This is so negative. It's just, I'm, my, I'm feeling heavy and oppressed. I, maybe I need some prayer. Maybe I'm possessed. What if I'm a Nephilim? Maybe Ham had to carry a Nephilim gene. Maybe we should go out for some donuts. I'd like that meatball sandwich now. I'm feeling just beaten down. I, I can't take us anymore, L.A. Let's talk about paying off my mortgage because God loves me. Okay, that sounds good. Look, I get it. But, I mean, it's a question of how deep you guys want to go. I mean, and here, that's why the humor all the way through it. Because if, if I just kept going like this, really, you're going, okay, okay, I'll go, I got it. Fallen angels, devil of technology. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. What do you want from me? Here's a check. And I'm mean, just like, <laughs> just joking. This is America's Stonehenge. <laughs> It's a 4,000-year-old site in New Hampshire. If you go up to New Hampshire, you've got to go there. This is a sacrificial table. That's about 10 feet long, about 6 feet wide. See that? That's to catch the blood. There's a hidden chamber behind this that you, if you approach it from this side, you don't know there's a chamber there. And the chamber... So, remember those creepy sci-fi movies when you're a kid? And you can watch them for a while until the music started. And when you hear that, you kind of go, oh, no, I can't. But part of you goes, oh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I can watch this. I can, I can get through it. And the other part's going, turn it off, turn it off. You won't we'll be able to go to sleep at night. Am I the only guy in the room who had that problem with that? Okay, I'm sorry. So here's, <laughs> here's America's Stonehenge. 4,000-year-old site. Megalithic architecture everywhere. And when you are in the center of the henge, a henge is a circle, okay? When you're there, there are these standing stones. They're also called menhers, standing stones. Most of them weigh a half a ton, a ton. And they stand up like this, they're planted into the ground. So when you stand in the center of the henge and you look out at the summer solstice, the standing stone, you would see the sun come up directly over that. So the first question is, 
Why are we doing this? <laughs> That's the first question. Why is it so important to put a stone in the middle of a field so when I stand here on the summer solstice, I can look out and see the sun? Who cares? I can take two rocks and do the same thing. Why am I creating this huge monument? Sticks would work just as well. And how do they know it's the longest day of the year? Who tells them it's the longest day of the year? And how do they know that this site is built on an 18.61 lunar cycle? 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Where does that come from? So in other words, someone has to stand there for 18 and a half years and write it down, the progression of the moon as it waxes and wanes. How does that work? 18 and a half years, otherwise you can't build the site on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Who told them that? Why is it built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle? Why is it that not only America's Stonehenge is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle, but Stonehenge England, which predates it, is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. And the Octagon Mound in Ohio is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. How does that work? Who's doing this? Where's this knowledge coming from? And there's advanced trigonometry in this stuff. Where does that come from? When trigonometry was invented in Europe, discovered in Europe about 2,000 years ago, and these sites are 4,000 years, 3,000 years, which predates the discovery of trigonometry. So who's telling who what? How's this all work? Where's this stuff coming from? But wait, it gets better. I've shown this to surveyors, and they go bonkers. They go bonkers when they see this. So, standing in the, in the center of the hinge, there's my summer solstice standing stone. Oh, well, that's, that's pretty cool, but, you know, eh. So Kelsey Stone, his grandfather bought the site. The Stone family bought America's Stonehenge. Go figure, right? So Kelsey is, is, was a university student at this time. This is a number of years ago. And he goes on Google Earth, and he draws a line from the center that's right there at the center of the hinge out to the summer solstice to Standing Stone. He draws a line on Google Earth. And he goes, gee, I wonder where the line would go. He's just playing around. He's just a, a college kid. Nothing else better to do but draw lines on Google Earth. So he's just checking this out. I wonder where this thing goes. So he, he extends the line, extends the line, and he's over Newfoundland, and he extends the line, and it splits the center trilithon at Stonehenge, England, thousands of miles away. <laughs> Folks, you can't do that. You can do it in modernity only if you triangulate from the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? To expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and herald the return of the king, Jesus. That's exposing what he did. We know something that we were just there about two months ago. We filmed for four or five days straight. And I'll tell you guys, you have to raise your right hand again. <clears throat> that's, Amer that's Stonehenge, England. This is, this is why it's called a henge. You see the circle right there. And this, this little monument here has about 28 solar alignments that are absolutely precise. And again, it's advanced geometry, advanced trigonometry, and the stones have to, who's doing this? And why? They do it because they can do it. And the knowledge is coming from somewhere, and it's not from here. It's from the fallen angels. It's Nephilim. Because, look, you can't, you can't draw that line in antiquity. And we show this to archaeologists, wow, it's just a coincidence. It's just a coincidence. All right. Oh, really? Well, what about the other lines? And nobody knows about this yet, but we do because they told us. So when we extend the line, this is where it gets really interesting. Now it's our research, because we took it further. Because they didn't know about the Nephilim. Watch what happens. It goes by Beirut. Beirut's the home of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians are the descendants of the Canaanites. The Canaanites are what? Nephilim tribe. They were seafarers. They sailed all over the planet. It's Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. We extend the line. It gives you an idea how vast it is. And guess what? It goes very close to Mount, next slide please, Mount Hermon. Where's Mount Hermon? That's where all, that's where all the nonsense. And it's 47 and a half miles exactly from Mount Hermon as it is from Gilgal Raphaim. Do I have a, does this go? Let me see. Is this just a still shot? Ooh, this is my, this is my film. We were in Israel last year. 
And this, I flew the drone over Gilgal Raphaim. <laughs> Larry's laughing. <laughs> Yeah, I took the drone out, and the guard guy's going, quick, we have to go, we have to go, quickly. I'm going, we're not going anywhere, pal. This is what I've been waiting for. It's my tour, we're staying. 42,000 tons of basalt rock. You should dim the lights so these guys can see this. So they can see it, or, or can watch it on the, on the smaller monitors. Concentric rings, Gilgai Raphaim, the circle of the giants, the wheel of the giants. Gilgai Raphaim, give you an idea. And you can only see it from the air. When you're down below, you, you don't know what you're looking at. You don't see the concentric rings. You have no idea what it is. But when you're up in the air, you see that it's absolutely incredible. And that's me right there. I'm flying the drone. <laughs> well done, LA. Keep going. Oh, don't drop the bomb. 42,000 tons of basalt stones. So I'm going to go back here. That's what it looks like from the air. I'm up about 350 feet. You can turn the lights back on. So watch this. You've got... Next slide, please. You've got Gilgal Raphaim right here, and you've got Baalbek. 47 and a half miles, 47 and a half miles. We don't know what the relationship is. Baalbek is the home of the largest stones ever hewn by anybody on this planet. They weigh over 1,400 tons. They're huge. They're like 60 feet long, 14 feet wide. They're unbelievable, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. So, before I get to the Great Circle Mound, you have to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. Hands up, please. I'm not... If you think I'm going to spill the beans to you guys without the hands raised, come on. you got to do your part. Okay, I state your name. I Promise not to divulge any of this information I to anyone. Yeah. So help me God. Okay. So we're, we're, we're with Dennis Stone, who, that's Kelsey's father. And Dennis he hasn't shown this information to anybody, but he showed it to us. And it will be in uh, episode four of the On the Trail of the Nephilim series. Three is coming out. Shameless plug. So here's the center of the hedge, right? You go thousands of miles away, America Stonehenge. This is where it goes off the rails. They took another standing stone. Let's just call it the, the winter solstice. And they did the same thing. They went on Google Earth and drew a line from the center to the winter solstice sanding stone. They wind up in Chaco Canyon. They took the equinox stone. They wound up at Teotihuacan, Mexico. They took the fall equinox stone. They wound up in Machu Picchu. They took another stone. They wound up on the Canary Islands where there's megaliths. It's the Axis Mundi, the center of the world on some level. We don't understand it, but you cannot do this in the ancient world. There's no way. It's an accident. There's no way these sites are so connected <coughs> by accidents. Every single site I just mentioned, Chaco Canyon, Teotihuacan, Mexico, Machu Picchu, the Canary Islands, uh, Stonehenge, England, these are major, major power points, major centers where stuff happened. And we, all we see is the vestiges of it. When you go to Machu Picchu, it's the same way. You see the Inca slop, but you also see this megalithic stuff, these huge stones which are put together flawlessly by another culture which just vanished. Pre-flood architecture, pre-flood architecture. The Great Circle Mound, now we move into dirt. We can go from the megaliths, and we go, it goes from this pristine stonework to the menhirs, the standing stones, to rough hewn stones, um, the chambers, to dirt. There's like a progression. And it's interesting, I was talking to the pastor about this last night. There's a throwaway scripture in the book of Genesis. And when you read it, you'll find it interesting. I've already gone an hour and 11 minutes. We are in big trouble. Because I'm on slide four. I'm just joking. <laughs> and I've got 80 more to go. No, just, but if we need to take a break, we take a break. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, great. Everybody talk at once. I have no idea what we're saying. Oh, the dirt. So 
There's a, there's a throwaway scripture. I was telling Pastor Larry about this. Mine like a steel sieve. Last night at dinner. Throwaway scripture in, in Genesis. And remember when I first read it, I was just blown away because I didn't understand. Well, what the heck is that there for? That's just, this is like 39 years ago when I'm a brand new Christian. I'm going, I, that doesn't make any sense. But after being in these sites, it says this. This is the Tower of Babel, post-flood. They built with, with brick instead of stone. Look it up. They're building Babel. They built with brick instead of stone. Why did the Holy Spirit put that in there? It's like a huge red flag. They built with the brick because the technology that existed before the flood no longer exists. They're building Babel to open the gateways, charge the portals, and allow the old ones, allow the fallen ones to come back in. The protocols of the heavenly war. This stuff is unbelievable. The precise shapes and sizes of the Nork <coughs> Mound testify to the hope of people's understanding of geometry and measurements. A large number of people were involved with, despite the sparseness of their lives, were motivated by forces other than coercion, since there was no record of slavery among the Hopewell. And because their culture had no hard metals or wheels, they likely dug earth with a wooden stick and moved it in woven baskets. Somebody shoot me now. <laughs> really. So look at this. Neither the Statens nor any of those who came later to marvel at the discoveries could live and guess about who had built them or for what purpose. The, the Statens are the people that came in first to this area. Even the Native Americans living there could offer no answer. So they don't know who built them. That's Fritz Zimmerman standing at the entrance to the Great Circle Mount. And we have incredible drone footage of this. Um, we flew the drone over 800 feet and then you can finally see the circle. And uh, this, I'll get into this when, tonight. I'm doing the mysterious mound builder, so I'll just kind of whet your appetite on this. Tonight we'll go deep, and you can see what we discovered at the Great Circle Mound. But you can only see it from the air. Who was the prince of the power of the air? You can see here the moat, which goes the entire area, and then you see the mounds. So we're supposed to believe that Native Americans who have no surveying tools create a moat that's pretty much dead level, as you'll see tonight. How is that possible? It's actually closer to 1,200 feet wide. A North Great Circle is one of the largest circuit earthworks in the Americas, at least in construction effort. The eight feet high walls surround a five foot deep moat, except at the entrance where the dimensions are even greater and more impressive. Researchers have used archaeo, uh, basically they look at the alignments uh, and archaeoastronomy to analyze placements, alignments, dimensions, and site-to-site -site interrelationships of earthworks. This research has revealed that the prehistoric cultures in the area had advanced scientific understanding as the basis of their complex construction. Where did it come from? No one asked the questions. If you have advanced, if you've got advanced geometry, if you've got trigonometry, where does that come from? And if you've got no writing utensils, how can you possibly do it? If you can't draw it out, wait, draw the thing out on deerskin? Is that what we're doing? Without compass or a ruler? Come on! And you're, and you're making complex geometric forms like this? What are you guys smoking? But this is the nonsense that they, that they pummel us with. So let's continue. The Octagon Mount in the 1980s, astronomer Ray Hively and philosopher Robert Horn of Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, analyzed the celestial orientation of the Octagon and its adjacent circle. This showed that the sight lines taken from various key points across the two shapes through openings in the embankment walls correspond exactly to the eight highest and lowest rising and setting points of the moon as the track's 18 and a half year cycle. How is that possible? Do you understand how we, we need to grasp this? That in, in, in a primitive environment, when you don't, you, you got to be able to track the moon every single day for 18 and a half years. So you got to know when, when it's not visible, when it's visible, when it's a quarter moon, with the whole deal. You got to be able to track it and then record that data someplace so then you can align all your stones and structures and whatever to reflect the 18 and a half year cycle. How did they do it? They didn't have it. They didn't have it. It's not there. So if it's not there, quit trying to tell us that Native Americans built it when they themselves, first of all, tell us that they didn't build it. Second of all, they didn't have the technology. So something else is happening. Oh, but we can't go there, LA. Why? Because we're Darwinists. In a Darwinian theory, there's only, there is no magic man behind the screen. <laughs> there's only Darwinism, mindless evolution over millions and millions of years. That's all they got. But we are free. Sunset's free, we are free indeed. 
We are free to think. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it just great? My gosh, am I glad I didn't become a biologist. You know, you've a sink to think. Find such a sink. Sorry. It doesn't work. And Darwinists can't go there because there's no supernatural, but we can. Because we believe in the Bible, which is supernatural events from one cover to the other. And that's who's doing it. It's fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture, and that's what I'm sticking to. Silistani, this is down uh, near the Lake Titicaca, very high up, 12,000 feet. Watch what they say. Welcome to Silistani. They're trying to tell us that these this archaeological complex was used as a necropolis for burials. So, see that tower? That's made of basalt. Basalt is about seven again, six to seven on the most hardness scale. This is over 3,000 years old. It's in a circle. It's also cone-shaped, which means that the base is, is smaller. It's not this way. It's cone-shaped. The base is smaller, and it goes up, which means that every centimeter, and I hate that because that goes back to the French Revolution, but I'm, so every eighth of an inch that you go up, or a sixteenth of an inch that you go up, the radius is changing. How is that done? How is that done? Why build something like this? If you work with wood, you know anything in the round is five times hard, as hard to do as just something square. Why not just build something where we all can have a, you know, a nice Sunday brunch afterwards and we're not spending 20 years building this thing? They did it because they could do it. Look at this. Look at the precise door. Now, this is what the Inca copy. This is the original. This is the Inca slop. I guess they're the same, right? <laughs> is it safe to say that there's a disparity between this and this? Okay, am I being fair? Thank you. So that's the Inca slop. <clears throat> this is the foundation work <clears throat> of what was, remains of one of the towers. Notice this is one slab of stone. Right here is one slab of stone. It curves up like this. This is embedded in the earth. Look at the radius here. Look at the way it comes up like this. Something happened to the tower. Something blew this thing apart. Right here is what the modern day archaeologists come in and they just put the slop here to hold the tower together so it doesn't collapse any further with the earthquakes. Why are the stones hollowed out? 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 They don't know. They have no idea. So it makes it even more complex. This was some sort of a machine, I believe. Look at all around it, stones that used to be part of the tower are lying all over the ground. Something happened which blew this thing apart, in my opinion. That's conjecture. Look at this. It gives you an idea of the way this thing leans. Look at the joinery. This is basalt. Look at the holes. Why? No one knows. Nobody has any idea of what these things are. This is the entrance. We crawled in. Look at the stonework. That white is what the modern day archaeologists, it's like a cement mortar mix because over the thousands of years things have moved a little, so as to try to preserve the Silistani Towers. That's what a tower looks like. And you can see how small a person is. So let me get this straight. We're going to wake up on a Monday morning and build one of the hardest structures you can possibly build 3,000 years ago in the Neolithic. We don't have, it's not bronze. We don't have, the Bronze Age hasn't happened yet. All we have is copper chisels. There are no ironworks. The basalt comes from 20 or 30 miles away in another quarry. We're going to haul the stones there and we're going to create this tower for why? To bury somebody? Or is it something else? Is it part of a machine? Is it part of a network? Look at this. Look at this. It's really hard to do, and yet it's there. Fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture. Look at these little protuberances on the stones. Where else did we see those? Right here, on the gateway to the sacred, so-called sacred valley. So whatever this machine is, it seems to leave this. We don't know why. Look at this, look at this. Thousands, of, not thousands, but hundreds of miles away, you get this. So there's a similarity. The machine, we can only surmise 
what it may or may not do. There's also this very mysterious island, which is right across from the towers, which essentially is dead flat. What's this for? Why drill this hole? What's this for? Why, if it's a funerary, what's that for? That's part of the machine. Something was collected in this area and then came out this hole, or vice versa. We don't know. We don't know how it was put together. Nobody does. This is from Jim Vieira, who uh, appeared in our, in, in our new series, On the Trail of the Nephilim. My opinion about the Towers of Silistani, <clears throat> let me get some water, is that an earlier race constructed them and that the Amaya Indians most likely used them for secondary internments. The bottom line is that there should be a civil debate about these matters. The arrogance and closed-minded attitudes I have encountered when dealing with archaeologists and anthropologists is disheartening. Theories change all the time, and we should be open to various possibilities. The majority of what any civilization regards as fact is later proven inaccurate. What does our civilization have wrong? Civilization have wrong. Archaeology is nothing more than educated guesswork usually taking place inside an echo chamber where careers and salaries are dependent on a specific narrative. Yet we are given the impression it is as certain as mathematical proofs. There is nothing wrong with asking questions and offering different viewpoints. Yet it is looked upon as an act of heresy in most academic circles. I leave the final thought to Thomas Kuhn for his structure of scientific revolutions. Mop-up operations are what engage most scientists throughout their careers. This paradigm-based research is an attempt to force nature into the preformed and relatively inflexible box that the paradigm supplies. No effort is made to call forth new sorts of phenomena. No effort to, to discover anomalies. When anomalies pop up, they are usually discarded or ignored. Anomalies are usually not even noticed, and no effort is made to invent a new theory, and there is no tolerance for those who do. Ask my wife about some of the arguments I've had with archaeologists. Very interesting. Puma Punku, yours truly, Puma Punku in Bolivia. What's this? What the heck is this? And look at the H blocks in the background. Look at the H blocks. What's this? Dead level after thousands of years. And the problem with Puma Punku is they took the stones in the, 18, in the 19th century and, and, and pummeled them and made railroad beds out of them. So we don't even know what this thing actually used to look like. Nobody has an idea. What's that for? What, what is that? What is this? It's a machine that's made of stone. And it did something, but we can only surmise maybe what it did. What the heck are these H blocks? Why go through all this trouble? So this is um, this is uh, Baalbek, which I talked about earlier. This is called the stone of the pregnant. Next slide. This is called the stone of the pregnant woman right here. It weighs about 1,200 to 1,400 tons. Right underneath it are two stones, which are bigger. Nephilim architecture fallen angel technology. These are the largest stones ever hewn by anybody. And people will say, well, you know, the Romans did this and they moved this. I get that. That's the Romans in the Iron Age. This isn't the Iron Age. This is Neolithic. So how were they cut? How were they cut? How were they moved? And no one has any answers to this. Nephilim architecture. What's this? This is in the, uh, Cusco in Peru. It's a doorway which they have sealed off with, with plexiglass. What are all these little nods here? What are these circles for? What are these like little grooves? Was it some sort of a machine with parts moving in and out? We think so. What's this? This is uh, Tiwanaku down in Bolivia. It's a gate of some sort. But why? why? Why make these things? What are they? And no one knows. And it was thrown down when the archaeologists discovered it in the 19th century. It was thrown down and they re-erected it. When you go there now, you can see it's all fenced in. <coughs> you take out your camera and some, some docent who spends his whole day guarding it. God forbid we should take a picture it's like this. But you pay him 20 solas and he goes, okay. <laughs> Always have so. What's this? Why the shape? This again is Oye Tintambo. Um, it's about in the Sacred Valley. And just, just look, look, look at the shape of the stones. Look at the pristine stonework. This is back to uh, 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 Puma Punku 
Tiwanaku. They're very close together in Bolivia. You can see it's an arid, dry place. It is bizarre. And it's just, just out in the middle of nowhere. There's really not a good hotel. At least there wasn't when I was there. So you stay in these like little places and they give you all pack of blankets because there's no heat in the room for the most part. At least at the hotels we were at. But the alpaca blankets, you put two or three of those things on, man, you're just toasty all night. They really work. They're great. But look at these H blocks. What the heck are they? This is Teo, this is um, Teotihuacan in Mexico, so-called Pyramid of the Sun. When I was there um, in 2014, I think, or 2015, I had Montezuma's Revenge, altitude sickness. I was 30 pounds heavier than I am now. Not a good combination. I got up, I climbed up to this first level right here. That's as far as I could go. I got, it's 5,000 feet above sea level. So this whole thing is just, I got up to here, it felt like my heart was going to pop out of my chest. And that's when I, okay, this is stupid. I lost 35 pounds and yada, yada, yada. So I missed it. I missed it. I didn't really understand what I was looking at. But this entire pyramid this base here is bigger than the Great Pyramid in Egypt. The knowledge comes out of nowhere. There's no pre-existing culture. It just, poof, we're going to build this thing. Where does the, who, who does the blueprints for this thing? Who is shown? And this whole thing was covered by some sort of plaster, which is about that thick. It's absolutely mind-boggling. And the astronomical alignments are all over the place. And archaeologists will tell us, well, you know, the, the natives built the city, yada, yada, yada. And then it was abandoned. Every single site, and there's a book here somewhere, every single site's the same thing. They come in, they build it, something happens, it's destroyed, people vanish. Is it possible? 180,000 Syrians, right? And the prophet's sitting here with his, with, his, with his aid. Lord, open his eyes. Goes out and he sees the chariots of fire. She's the angel of the Lord just standing there. Next morning, 180,000 Syrians, boom, just like that. Is it possible, to conjecture, total conjecture, that God allows these things to progress to a certain point and then just goes, okay, game over, and sends his angel? We have a, a record, Tim Alberino told me this. See the way I always give credit to people? You know, got to do it. Unlike certain people who plagiarize our books, <coughs> you won't go there. <clears throat> about the Nephilim, but we won't say anything about that, will we? <clears throat> and now, well, it's all it's all good, it's all in good fun. Praise the Lord. So Tim Alberino is reading this ancient Spanish manuscript from the conquistadors, and and the um, the natives were telling him the Inca were telling him that they have a legend where the giants. And we're all adults here, so I can say this. They're all male giants, and they're out there fornicating with each other in a field, according to the Inca, okay? So this is, you know, homosexual behavior to the nines. And they're, they're doing this stuff. The giants are out there fornicating with each other. There's no female giants. Get the picture? An angel appears. They just called it this angel of light. Appears in the sky, takes a flaming sword, and kills them all. Just like that. So there's precedent. We've got it in antiquity. Is that, is that how it works? I just cited a biblical example and then a non-biblical example. I don't know. But why is it the Hopewell Indians, or whoever they were, the Hopewell culture just vanished? Why does the people that built Poverty Point in Louisiana, second largest mound in the United States, why do they just vanish? Why doesn't anyone know who really built Cahokia? Why has no any idea who built Sacsayhuaman? or any of this other stuff. Nobody has a clue. Oh, the Inca built it. No, they didn't. The Inca tells us they did But because you have a narrative, it's got to fit into your narrative. So that's that's a Teo, Teo Khan. That's another shot of it from the side. Look at it. It's not nearly as pristine as Sacsayhuaman or Tambo. It comes much later than that, but it's the same technologies being deployed. That's the Pyramid of the Moon. So I'm looking, I'm standing at, in the Pyramid of the Sun, looking at the Pyramid of the Moon. Now they call it these things because it's, it sounds convenient. Ritualistic sacrifice was done. This is the Tomb of the Giants. I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick here. This is the Tomb of the Giants in Sardinia. These megaliths, we were just there last year. Look at the size of a megaliths. We believe that the giant is built underneath here, or buried underneath the tomb. 
and that this structure was built by giants, when you go in here, and we see this in chambers all over the Americas, there's a place where you can go, the initiate would go, a human being would go, and they would, they would stay there overnight for two or three days. There's like little chambers they can lay down. There's one in America, Stonehenge. We've seen them all over the place. One in Sardinia. And you would go there, and the spirits of a Nephilim, demonic spirits, demon spirits, that's where you get the power from. And there's nothing different. The shamans today do exactly the same thing. No, nothing has changed in thousands of years. So the theory is this, that in the days of Noah, there was an ancient grid system that covered the planet in the days of Noah. There was some sort of a grid system which connected all these points, as you see here. Everything was connected. We don't know how it worked. Some people believe that the Great Pyramid of Giza was a power plant. That's, that's my take on it. But see, because all these other researchers on the History Channel and everything else, because they don't have a biblical um, basis to what they believe, they don't, they don't hold to a biblical worldview, they never come up with any answers. Well, it's always extraterrestrials, some advanced civilization which came. We're saying, yeah, they were really advanced, but they were fallen angels, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. All this connects. It's a unified theory. All of it connects. What happened in the past is just being echoed today, but slightly different, slightly twisted. The, the burgeoning UFO phenomenon, and it is burgeoning, and it is ongoing, and it's never going to stop until the whole thing is revealed, is the coming great deception. As in the days of Noah, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. And that's where we are. That's where we are. And it's time for all of us in this room to wake up, start arming yourself, put on the armor of God. And when you put on the armor of God, I don't have to lecture you on this, I'm assuming that you already know this. We're putting on Jesus when we do that. We're acknowledging him. And something that we need to understand is that the flesh never, you know, the flesh is irredeemable. We're not, we're not redeeming the flesh here. Our spirits are the things that are redeemed in us. The flesh is, the flesh is always going to do what the flesh wants to do. I can never redeem the flesh. The flesh is never going to get any better. The lust of the eyes will always be there. The pride of life will always be there. The lust of the flesh will always be there. All that, it never goes away, ever. Ever, 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 ever. But what we can do is we can sow into our spirit man or woman and go, I will walk in the spirit today. I will walk with the Lord today. Body, mind, you will submit to my spirit man or woman. End the story. I will not go there. When the thought comes in, no, I'm not doing that. Take that thought captive. I'm not going there. Sorry. I reject that in the name of Jesus. And we walk with the Lord. And oftentimes, you know, we forget how to do that until something slams us because we get involved in what we're doing. Check in, mind the checks. Put on the armor of God. Take the helmet of salvation. Where does our salvation come from? The death of Jesus on the cross. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Who is our righteousness? Yeshua. Take the belt of truth. Who is the truth? What is the truth? Who is the author of all truth? Yeshua, Jesus. Put the, the sandals of peace so wherever we go, it's not our peace, it's his peace. And he is the Prince of Peace. Take the shield of faith, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Hold that thing up. When the enemy presses in, like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take a sword of spirit, which is, which is the, the word of the living God. Wash ourselves. Wash our, I, have, I have a whole list of things that I just kind of say, and I just kind of mutter, putter, the, the kind of putter through them on a daily basis. And sometimes one will jump out, and I'll just sit there and just wash my head with it. You know? Just wash my brain with it, because my brain needs to get washed every morning, first thing. I need to send every day on the Lord. So we are living in a time which is unprecedented, and we'll get there tomorrow night. Tonight will be the mysterious mound builders, the mathematical mysteries of the mound builders, and I'll give you a little sample on, on number three, secrets of the supernatural voices from the other side. And I'll tell you some stories about that which are just mind-boggling. And people who've seen the film, only a couple of people who've seen it, have stated that this opens up a new paradigm with this whole now thing. Because no one's ever delved into the demonic possession, the fact that some of these houses that are built on mounds, tables levitate. That's not normal. It's demonic. They're, they're satanic strongholds. Thank you so much. Appreciate you listening. And I'll see you tonight at 7.